Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. What? You have two, the shiniest episode yet of the show. Two special guests in the house. <laughs> two very special guests. <laughs> I'm not what special. is up, everybody? Welcome to the DMBA show. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Man, what? we really missed vote on that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a very special edition for you of the show. Not because I have D-Line here, but he is here. Yeah, it's, it's not not special. Yeah, it's not, here. not particularly <laughs> special. Not because I have Harrison Wind here. Not at all. Not at all. And not even just because we have Larry O'Brien here. In the background. It almost looks fake on the camera, by the way. Do you see how it looks like it's not it actually here? It looks so good, it looks fake. It does look so good. It's actually sitting right here. <laughs> yeah. And then seated to my left, president of the Denver Nuggets, Josh Kroenke. Happy to be here, guys. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Thanks for I coming. I feel on. we need to make some sort of a noise. Poo, yeah, yeah, poo, yeah. Well, what would usually, you do? Usually, you <laughs> awkwardly ask the guest to do an air horn. Yeah. I yeah. should have. We actually should have prepped him to do like an. Eagle. What noise did Calvin make? Did he make it? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. But I will say, Vlatko did a great air horn. That's true. Ah, okay. Vlatko was the best air horn. All right, definitely well, the best. I would need to see footage if yeah, I'm, I'm going to go there. I don't well, want to embarrass myself unnecessarily. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is. Uh, we appreciate you coming on. This oh, is my very, pleasure. Very cool. Very Sorry, I'm late. Uh, it's. I was at the Rams game out in L.A. yesterday, and then one thing happened to another, and losing that little hour from yeah. L.A. to Listen, here. I, I was yeah. busy too, but. <laughs> <I'm there. laughs> is that actually, I wasn't as late as Larry. That's, that's true. That's true. true. That's true. We'll, we'll we'll really blame Larry. Larry here. You did beat Larry. Yeah. <laughs> Larry took 47 here. years to get here. I like, I like that's how exactly he, right. He basically just said he's hungover. He was late out in LA. Yeah. No, he no, no, no. a little bit later. Just than trust than me. Yeah. Trust me too. Just me, I was, I wish I was hungover. Unfortunately, the Rams took a tough L yesterday, well, um, and tough. it happens. Um, We've seen a lot of. There were some eyebrow raising moments, but you know, fell short. Got a good young team though. Uh, I think Sean's got it on the right track again, and yeah. you know I'm optimistic. We'll see how we finish this year. There you go. That was for all you Rams fans out there. Yeah, yeah all you Rams fans. Show. I know you're listening. <laughs> in. Um, I want to ask this one. This was we were talking about how to start. The Larry O'Brien is here. Where is it going to reside? Everybody puts it in a different place. Have you already decided where it's going to live? Yes, um, absolutely. And you know, it's it's funny because I was just going back and forth with Nick about it. I, um, you know, for you guys that have been around the Nuggets for a number of years now. Uh, what year was it we redid the locker room? I think it was 2017, maybe? Yeah. 16? 16, I think. Um, and so it's an interesting story from there to here because when I designed that locker room and helped with, you know, put things in the right places and bring it up to kind of modern NBA standards, uh, if you recall, we put in that long hallway in front. And oh. um, when we redid that locker room, I told anybody that would listen, would listen, I said, we have to have a long hallway in front. And they said, no, it doesn't really... The, it doesn't lay out that well. And I said, no, no, it has to be that way because when we win the championship, that's where our trophy is going to go. Oh, my God, I and, love it. And anybody that walks by the, in the hallway on game night is going to glance down the hallway and they're going to see our trophy at the end of that. And um, it's finally going to go there tomorrow night. That is perfect. Yeah. Have you that, noticed that is a this? perfect story? Is there yeah. like a case, is there like a little shelf or something? Uh, it's, I, it's being it's being done now. Yeah, I, I can it. envision um, in my mind where it would be, though. Yeah, but. I never thought about it. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I've had in the back of my mind the whole time. And, you know, when you finally win the thing, there's so many thoughts that go through your mind. And as somebody was asking me that, like, about a month ago, like, hey, where, where do you want the trophy to live permanently? And I was like, oh, my goodness. I'm like, how did this whole thing slip my mind until now? And so we have a little case for it. Um, and we're redoing a few things at that little end of the hallway at the end of the Nuggets locker room. So the players will see it every time they come and go to the floor. I love that. That's I like great. that too. That's a grad. Did not expect. I, that. I thought that was a little starter. That was like a great little story out of it. <laughs> yeah. I know. I like architecture based off of future trophy winning. Yeah. I, my my home is set up for my Emmy when it. Uh, when <laughs> That's, it's right. That's right. That's right. The incoming <laughs> Emmy for this show might, might be a minute. We'll see. You know, it's, it starts with the mindset, and That's you know, we true. had to kind of uh, for something that had never been done before, we had to kind of will it to existence, and we finally did. I yeah. like that. Love one. that. Um, is there any like? Has it been around? I know it's not like the Stanley Cup where everybody gets to take it, but have you done anything particularly fun with it? Um, I haven't done anything particularly fun with it uh, just yet. Uh, the, some of the players had asked about possibly taking it places this summer. And, you know, I mean, like the Stanley Cup, unfortunately, 
you know, for any of the Avs fans listening right now, uh, you know, we have a championship a year ago that I can kind of base it off of, and those experiences were very fresh. Um, but that, that's something that the NHL builds into every summer on the back end of winning a championship. And so they have two guys that go everywhere with the cup, mm. the keepers of the cup, uh, to make sure the cup stays safe. Um, that is not the case with the Larry <laughs> O'Brien trophy. And once I started planning out logistics with some of our players, they, they immediately kind of laughed and they're like, we'll figure it out another time because we we're going to have to have people with it. And I just didn't trust that it wouldn't get dropped or damaged right. somewhere along the way. Also, right. I feel like the Stanley Cup can endure a little more damage than than yeah. this guy. The Stan- if the Stanley Cup could talk, it would have a lot of stories, yeah. that's for sure. We, give- saw, yeah, we saw the Stanley Cup up close, and as my friend Blaze says, it has seen some shit. It is, it is definitely, it has definitely seen a lot of things. And, you know, you give, you give players a reason to celebrate and a trophy they can drink out of, and <laughs> right. a lot of things can happen. Man, what do you I, expect? I think Joe Lacob ruined the taking the trophy home <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> No maybe, that, maybe that's when the rule started that they uh, yeah. they don't let anybody take the trophy anymore uh, you after, guys, you, after him. You guys can all Google that one uh, <laughs> if, you, if you don't catch the reference. Um, let's talk about this playoff run, though. You talk about having a mindset and having a vision. Mm-hmm. First of all, just the parade. You got two parades in a row, abs and then and then yeah. like, two parades in Denver. I'm not counting the L.A. one. You was this? Did they go the parade in particular for this Nuggets one? Did you ever envision what it would look like? And did it feel, as you're going through it all, did it feel like what you envisioned? Um, you know, for the Nuggets one, uh, I must confess, I, I, was, I was a little more sober than I was for the right. Avalanche one, for whatever reason. And I think it was because the year before I got, I got caught up in some of the fun. And it's not that I didn't remember every, anything or everything. It's that I wanted to make sure that I, I remembered and soaked in every moment. Um, and, uh, and so this time around with the Nuggets, uh, I was on a fire truck with my dad which is exceptionally special um, because you know he and I have been at this for a number of years now and basketball is you know a sport that he played as a young man and that I played as as much as I could until I couldn't play anymore uh, out of college and um, but the abs you know that was it was an amazing day and the nuggets wasn't just just as incredible Um, but you know to to the experience the energy with my dad and then be up there and I was on a on a on a fire truck with uh, Jamal and his father and Nicola and his family and to be up there was a very unique experience with those guys and to to be on the receiving end of you know the love that was being shared for those two guys in particular uh, and to see fans you know expressing their gratitude to- towards those two guys uh, was wonderful Michael Malone's performance at the parade. <laughs> this is really why he was sober. He's like somebody's yeah. got to. He left that for for the Nuggets. You coach. know, I, he, I mean, uh, did, did you expect that from him? I mean, Mo's got some. Mo's got some stuff to him. That's he for does. sure. I think you guys know. He does. Um, but you know, however you wanted to experience that day in your own right, I mean, everybody had their their own kind of fun. And I think Coach Malone seeing him, he had he had his you know the the shirt that I think DeAndre gave him. Mm-hmm. Um, he was at one point I think he was wearing maybe Peyton Peyton's Watson's chain. chain. Yeah. Um, and he had some great quotes throughout the day. Some of which, like you know, I kind of kind of caught me off guard. But I at the in those moments, I mean. Then I thought back to the Avs parade and presentation, and I mean, Gabe Landeskog went to the mic yeah. with his shirt off with yeah. a Swedish flag tied around his, sh- his <laughs> shoulders, carrying the Stanley Cup, and I believe swore a few times. So Nobody has ever looked cooler, by the way. That's the coolest anyone has yeah. ever looked. Yeah, I mean, standing in front of the Capitol with your, your, <laughs> yeah. the flag of your country shirtless with a cup over your head. That's yeah. a pretty power good. move yeah. right But there. I, I think Coach Malone definitely brought the heat for sure. On it the was an all-time parade performance. It all was. Time. Truly. Yeah, it was. Truly. It absolutely was. Yeah. And the funniest part was, you know, we had you know a reception afterward, and then the players really wanted to go to Las Vegas that night and to celebrate before everyone scattered. And Coach Malone came with us, and so he was, you know, he was he was not singing a different tune by about you know <laughs> six o'clock that night. But you know the the energy that was uh, that he put into the parade definitely caught up with him by by the, by that evening. But we all still had a great time together. Yeah, it was fun. The energy or the rakia. Yeah, one, yeah. One, 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 of, one of the two. Definitely the rakia. <laughs> I, I know from experience that that bit me when I was over in Serbia with uh, yeah. Nikola doing his MVP thing, and that's. I don't know if they use that to drink or to clean paint off yeah. walls, but it's, <laughs> Both. it is something special. Did you have some out of a plastic bottle? Uh, yes. Really? Yeah, I, I that's that's I had, the best kind. Yeah, I had I had all kinds. I mean, Nicola, I have videos of us dancing around in a circle kind of out in this farmhouse while, before we were having dinner, <laughs> and they had all different kinds, and you know, by the end of the night, you were, you were ready for bed, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask you a little bit more about Sambor here in a little bit, but mm-hmm. I want to stick on this theme of this, this run here. Was there a moment throughout the playoff run that 
it was especially meaningful to you or where you knew that the, they were going to win or that just was the most satisfying? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I did, I did see something different. I was, uh, to, to, to give it a little bit of, of context coming into the playoffs. Um, I had a few people ask me at the beginning of last season around this time last year, what my goal was and what I thought the season would be moving forward. Um, and I said, really guys, I was like, my only goal is for us to be healthy. I just mm -hmm. want to see how good we are. Um, because I think if we're healthy, we're going to have a, a real chance at doing something special. Uh, and so as the playoffs kind of dragged nearer and nearer, I was just, that's the main, was the main thing I was watching. Then you get into the first round and I thought we played well for a few games. Uh, Minnesota tested us, I think in a, in a lot of ways, maybe some people don't understand that was a really tough matchup for us and they're a very good team going to be very, very good this year. Um, but in that second round versus Phoenix, uh, you know, there were some, some signs, game one, game two, and then uh, in the second round, um, we, we had a look on our face, and it wasn't even really after one of the victories, um, but I remember seeing it, and I'm not even gonna say when, but our guys kind of looked at each other and they said, we can do this. And I, I saw a collective belief start to wash over the group that said, we are good enough, we belong here, and let's start acting like it. And you could see that mindset start to take shape uh, very, very clearly in, in, in that round. And then moving forward, you could see we were almost businesslike in our approach, for sure. Game, yeah. game one versus Phoenix, Jamal yeah. is at half court screaming into the crowd, we're ready yeah. for this. Yep. I think that's like when I knew. I was like, oh, these guys are probably in the championship. Game yeah. one against the Suns. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we're going to hit on it a little bit, but the history of where this team came from and where it got to. I mean, I kind of saw it in the Nuggets before the season. I think we all kind mm -hmm. of did. Like, yeah. not in the definitive way, like, oh, this is going to happen. But, like, when Jokic joins the team, when we go through – I mean, I know that we're going to go over yeah. this, but, like, was there a point in – the like, even be, before this run, before this year, where you looked at this team and thought that maybe there was something special there? Yeah, and you guys will remember it well. Um, it was when we traded for Aaron. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we make that trade – Aaron comes on board, and we had a full roster for 10 games, I think. And um, I think we were like 8-2 and two or 9-1. and one, mm -hmm. um, And we were beating good teams and beating them definitively. You had that you Clippers know, game. We had, there. Yeah, there were, some, there were some good moments in there where we saw some things where we kind of were you know, giving each other the nudge uh, and wondering if this might be a group that could really compete for it. Uh, and then you know the rest is history because in game 10 or 11 jamal went down with his knee injury yeah and you know when that when that happens to to a guy like jamal and i think now the world really understands how good jamal murray is uh there was no place for us to hide um we needed we needed to let him get healthy we never really considered making any moves um because the continuity and the, the trust that had been established between jamal and nicola over the development of their careers you're never going to replace that no matter how good the player might be. And so um, let's wait it out. Let's get Jamal healthy. And then, you know, we fast forward 12 months from Jamal's injury. He was getting close to coming back and you're getting, you're inching towards the playoffs. And Michael was still hurt at the time. And we all kind of looked at each other. And, and even I think Nicola was, was in into the conversation as well. And we said, it doesn't do us any good to push everyone out there right now. Let's, let's sit back, relax and get ready for next fall. And so that's what we did. And, you know, we came out of the gate. And then Jamal started to show flashes early, hit the game winner in Portland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we started moment. to see that Jamal was really back. And the biggest adjustment for him was going to be, you know, obviously there's a physical aspect, but he never had an injury like that before. And the mental aspect of trusting your body again is something you can't really talk about. You have to go out there and do it. And so it took a little bit of time for us to get into that phase. And about 20 games in, you could see that hey, this might be a group that could do it. And we just kept getting better as the year went on. Had a little bit of a lull. What was that, like, like yeah, late, at the end of the February, year. March? Were you nervous? Like 15 games. Did you know or yeah. were you nervous? I have a theory on why that happened. <laughs> um, <laughs> so do we. <laughs> I'd be curious to hear what your theory might be. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys go first. Let's, let's, oh, our theory let's is start that there. Uh, they knew they were good enough and they were resting, in a sense. They were <laughs> mentally took their foot off the gas because they knew what they had and they were... I mean, we spent the, we spent show after show being like, 
Guys, they can play defense. They're just not playing defense. Yeah. We spent show after show wondering if they could flip the switch. And then five minutes into game one against like, Minnesota, oh, we were like, oh. okay, they can flip the switch. <laughs> Jokic, too. I think the Jokic ESPN stuff, I think, probably yes. also took some of the wind out of the sails. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Oh, I hope they're. You're, I, that's, that would be where my theory would, would go. Um, I don't, I don't know this to be 100% true, but I've talked to enough people that, because I've never gone back and looked at the data, but like, Around that time, um, you know, to piggyback off my comment earlier about wanting us to be healthy, the same guy asked me, they go, what do you think Nicola will do in his, you know, at coming off two, M two MVPs? And I go, well, I go, I said, if we're healthy, you know, that's my main goal. And I said, if we are healthy and healthy the whole season, I go, Nicola's going to average a triple-double, will be the first seed in the West, and they're going to have a hell of a hard time not giving him his third MVP. And you were right. so if you watch that, it wasn't that hard. You watch <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. Um, if you watch that, uh, you know, he, he basically was there averaging a triple double. And then, you know, certain people decided to make the MVP race um, and they tried to stir the pot in a way that I didn't think was very fair. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Nicola being who he is, uh, he, he pays attention to things more than people might realize. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, the world now knows who he is and knows his personality. Uh, but he, he, he lo he's, a, he's a human being. He sees things. And even though we didn't have a full roster for the two years he won the MVP, I mean, it, it was I think he was hands down the MVPs of the league. And he, he should have been at it again last year. People got fatigued um, along the way, and they wanted to figure out another way to, to give it to somebody else, which is fine. But I think now that the we've gone on the run that we did through the playoffs, uh, I think that you know people know that he is the MVP of the NBA and, and should be. Um, why we went on that little lull in the in that period? I think we were about seven games up, seven mm -hmm. or eight games up in the West, and we might have had a player that had been too, too fed up with some of the headlines and just decided to, you know, hey, let's let's make sure we're healthy, let's right keep our mindset too. right, and let's be ready to hit that switch come playoffs. And that's exactly what happened. And it made you know? for a better story, in my opinion, because <laughs> it, instead of going into the playoffs with maybe an unnecessary pressure and now this or that, it almost made a little bit of, it added to the great underdog story, which is obviously very real about this team, but it added to the underdog story for Jokic, who yeah. one of the most gratifying things for me personally about this run was where Jokic's narratives started where the Nuggets narrative started to going into the playoffs and two games into the Lakers series it's well this isn't fair nobody yeah. can beat this team like yeah. <laughs> it's like, wow. I know they it's like, let's rewind the tape from four weeks ago where this team was gonna get upset by whoever <laughs> yeah. came out of the play and they did they went right. from undermanned to unfair to in, unfair yeah. in one round and I, you know I know you have to be somewhat political about this I, I I can respect I'm not trying to put you on the spot but I am asking what if there was a favorite <laughs> moment favorite game was there one that was more gratifying than the others one moment we were you like, can say game four against the Lakers. you can say it if you want but you don't have to <laughs> or you could say game five against the heat game five <laughs> against the heat uh, i mean it doesn't mean up until that buzzer sounded in game five i thought i was like something can still happen yeah sure yeah, something totally. can still happen nicola can turn an ankle and you know, don't he you might say come that back. now. What are you doing? No, but I mean, like, <laughs> this is I'm, I'm not. I mean, you guys can, can yeah. knock on all the wood that you want. This is the world that I have to live in, right? Yeah, right. And you know, and, and it's happened to us in all of our teams and all of our different sports. Um, and you, you think that you know, there's, there's all these different formulas that go into winning a championship, but the very real factor that you have to acknowledge is luck, mm. and that comes with injuries. And, you know, we might have had a team that was good enough to do this a few years ago, but we didn't have Jamal Murray. Right. And we had to get him back and we had to, to get healthy. And uh, once you can do that, um, you know, I think when this team's healthy, they can they can achieve great things. And again, again, this season, too. A couple of quick ones here. We're going to move on here in the second segment and just talk a little bit more about your experience, what you, what you do for the team, what your role in all of this mm -hmm. is. But real quick, I don't think I've ever heard you on the record talk about Josh Kroenke, the basketball player. I know you were well, one. I think Adam is challenging you to one on one. Just I mean, that's right. that. Oh, I gotta find out what kind <laughs> of player he is. First. Yeah. I gotta, I gotta yeah. Can he fit? No, at this? Adam on the take, take me back though. I just want to know what kind of player you were. Well, if there's a, if there's, we're talking about a one on one game. I'll, I'm gonna go ahead and pass because my body, <laughs> my mind tells my body to do things yeah. that my body sends the signal back right. to my brain that says absolutely not. <laughs> I've got that same thing by hurt. the way. That's, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, in another lifetime, uh, I was a basketball player uh, all up until the time. Uh, through college at the University of Missouri, we were in the Big 12 back then. Um, I wasn't exactly, you know, you know, set your hair on fire with what I was doing out there. But um, my college coach was actually a guy named Quinn Snyder, 
um, who's coached at the professional level now for a number of years. And uh, I can't tell if that was a joke. We do cover the NBA. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> well, some people that are watching okay, this might true. not understand. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, obviously you guys know who he is. Um, head coach of the Jazz for a number of years, now coaches down in Atlanta. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we ran a lot of pro-style offense. Mm. And the great thing was it was, it was good for a few of my teammates. Um, me not being a professional-level player, I need a lot of screens, and I got to run off those screens. And if I'm going to get open, that's how I needed to do it. Um, but I learned how to play the game uh, in a certain way and how to look at the game in a certain way because he was such a very good coach. Um, and so that I didn't, you know, I think I averaged, I don't know, five points a game, something like that. I started half my, my junior, my senior year, and then got beat out by more talented guys below me. Um, they just had more 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 gifts than I did, honestly. Shooter though, I mean, uh, I was a ball. shooter. Yeah, yeah, I could I could definitely shooter. shoot. I'm um, comping you to like a Joe Harris, JJ Redick <laughs> type guy. I, yeah, I mean, I could. I mean, JJ, I think is one of the best shooters of all time. But you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, I shot my junior year. I think I shot like 48 percent from three. Ooh. Sounds more like Giannis oh. to me. I don't know. Yeah. Sounds more like Giannis. Yeah. He's, yeah. He's so, but I mean, the him. college three is a lot closer than the yeah. pro three. But um, Mike Miller, I think, once said you were a better shooter than him at one point in time. Mike and I had had a lot of fun. Uh, we grew up kind of on the same traveling AAU teams, and Mike, obviously, as a shooter, speaks for himself. The guy that I was really close with, and would and we would get in shooting contests and would go shot for shot, um, was a guy named Jason Capono. Yeah, and, sure. you know, he won. He did wind up winning a few NBA three point contests. So, like, I kind of hung my hat on the fact that I was like, hey, you know, my I think my, he might still hold the record for single season three point. He might. I mean, he, you know, off the rack, especially. I mean, catch and shoot. Jason was automatic. Such a simple movement. And it just it was up and, and in the air before you knew it. But yeah. to tell you how nerdy I was, I wore a headband in high school because of Jason I, Capone. I bet you did. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Looked as dumb as Jason Capone just does too, by the Jason. way. But I was just like, if I put this on, I feel like it's, I'm a shooter. Dude, it's really hard for a white guy to wear a headband. <laughs> no, like, yeah. It's really hard to pull You've that off. You've got to shoot 50% from yeah. three to pull it off. <laughs> you have so. to be the best shooter be really good. on the planet. That'd be really good. <laughs> we, don't, we also don't need any visual aids. For what a nerd. Oh, you come on. <laughs> we we know. Here. All right, let's take a break. On the other side, we're going to get into a little bit of what makes a good owner in the NBA. What are the keys? What have you learned over the years that make for a good ownership group? Uh, at Bet365, we don't do ordinary. We believe that every sport should be epic. Every touchdown, every game, every point, every play. From the moments that are legendary to the ones that fly under the radar. Guys, check out Bet365. We have these awesome custom DNVR bets on Bet365. You go on the app, they're right there at the top. Oh, yeah. There was a Russell Wilson prop on Sunday that we Listen, got the man. worst beat on ever. <laughs> he just needs to complete that stupid pass in the fourth quarter to, um, I don't know who it was. I, I think Javante Williams or uh, McLaughlin. But anyways, <laughs> uh, you can hit those bets up. Must be 21 plus physically located in Colorado. Please gamble responsibly. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem and wants help, call or text 1-800-GAMBLER. Also, make sure to check out Primo Hoagies. Oh. We all went down to Primo Hoagies a couple weeks ago now. Hell yeah, dude. They rolled out the red carpet for us. We all got some Hoagies. One cool thing about Primo Hoagies is their menu is massive. It's expansive. It You could order a different thing there every single day and keep doing that for like years. Yeah. Uh, so check out Primo Hoagies. They got locations in both Denver and Centennial. You can order your party trays in advance and online. PrimoHoagies.com. Use code DNVR for $2 off a Primo sized Hoagie when ordering online. We're back. Um, back here with Josh Kroenke, president of the Denver Nuggets. And also part of the ownership group. And that's the part I want to ask about next. You've been at this for a while now, you and your family. Mm -hmm. What makes a good owner? What are the traits of a good owner? Um, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I think some of the things that I've learned over the years and tried to apply, um, because we have to look at this uh, from a lot of different perspectives. You have to look at it, number one, you have to try to make sense of it from a business perspective. I think that's, a, that's the hardest truth about some of the stuff that we do is there are checks and balances to everything and it's not just funny money that's flying all over the place with some of these contracts you see with these some of these players and how fast uh they've they've risen um you also have to view this as a community asset and you understand that you're managing something that is as much as you might you know call us ownership um I always say that we're kind of custodians of like something that's more of a community asset, like I said. 
um, because without your fans supporting you and having that passion, you don't really have much. Um, and I felt all sides of that going through kind of the build process with the Nuggets in particular. Um, and, you know, there's, there is a delicate balance to try to finding the right mix of everything because at the end of the day, people, um, they want to know that you're a fan too. And uh, I think people know me well enough, hopefully around Denver, to know that I'm a massive fan of our teams and try to give them every chance that I can to succeed um, because that's what my father demands. Um, but there's also other demands on trying to make sense of the business um, all over the place from a commercial perspective, from a sporting perspective, and uh, from a community relations perspective too. Um, but from an ownership perspective, I say some of the principles that I try to, to say basic, uh, basically would be you want to hire really good people, empower them to do their jobs, and then also understand in the moment why certain decisions are being made. Um, so you can give your opinion, but also to ensure that people are being held accountable down the road in case that doesn't come to fruition the way that, that things might have seemed at the moment whenever you're making a decision over a coach or a player across anything. One of the um, the traits, I feel like, of the Jokic era and of you guys is just being patient. And we always talk about this. A lot of teams in your guys' situation, you know, might have traded Nikola Jokic yep. when he was mm -hmm. coming on the scene, might have traded Jamal Murray, might have tried to cash in the chips for an already proven superstar. How were you guys able to just stay patient and see the vision? Because especially in this day and age in the NBA, that seems like a really hard thing to do. Yeah, um, I guess, you know, patience is a virtue. <laughs> um, and, you know, patience, uh, it's, it's, it requires it, um, a lot of different things, but the main one um, it requires is, is a lot of communication. And it requires a lot of honest communication in the moment about where you are growth-wise growth, growth -wise with you know, your players, your coaches, and, and your organization as a whole. Because um, if you're going to do it from, from scratch, kind of like we, we did, and that was really the only way that we thought we could do it in Denver. You know, some of the mother markets have the liberty of being able to attract free agents through cap space or superstars um, in trades. And my first experience um, when I really was put in charge of the team in 2010 was to fly to Baltimore and have Carmelo ask to be traded. Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of helped shape my mindset and how to eventually have a successful organization and try to build a champion in, in Denver. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, like I said, from an ownership perspective, you want to understand the why in the moment so you can hold people to counter later um, in case something does, you know, go wrong or, um, you know, that, that you have to test that patience that you were just talking about because it does get tested in many different ways, many different times. And, you know, and for Nicola in particular, about a year and a half into his career, uh, you started to have enough data to be able to really put things in perspective of what he might be able to do. Um, and I've told this story to a few people, but it's a fun one for always for me to retell because uh, we had Nurkic at the time and mm -hmm. you're going through trying to figure out a potential twin tower lineup. Um, that wasn't really working because the rest of the rest of the league was trending small at the time. The Warriors were in their heyday. Um, and so you had small ball and three point shooting going on all over the place. You still had bigs that were having success, but it was around a different type of a system and playing two big guys at that point in time, especially young big guys that didn't understand what they were doing defensively, just kept getting exposed. And uh, but we did a, a player A and player B comparison. Tommy put it together. You guys know Tommy in our front office and Tommy bracelets. <laughs> <laughs> the, the chat loves Tommy. <laughs> chat loves Tommy. All right, yeah. perfect. Um, well, I think it was Tommy that put this together, and it was player A and player B, and they were both compared in their second seasons. <clears throat> the only difference between player A and player B was um, player A was two years older than player B at the time of his second year in the NBA. Um, just because he entered the league at an older age. And you could clearly see that player, player B was better than player A. And so I asked, and if player B was Nikola Jokic. And so I'm like, okay, well, who is player A, expecting it to be, you know, Nurk or something along those lines? Sure. And, uh, and player A was Larry Bird. <laughs> and so right away, you're like, Oh, <laughs> maybe we've got a little something here. Yeah. Okay. Like the flashes of the behind the back passes and the overall feel that we kind of think that we're seeing with the eye test is really starting to show itself statistically. And um, then we made the decision to put him in the starting lineup. And all this was kind of coalescing about a week before that 
uh, fateful night in Dallas when Nikola was put into the starting lineup. Goodness. And we were kind of, you know, in a bit of a, a skid. We'd lost like six or seven. We weren't playing terribly, but we weren't winning games. And it wasn't a style that really looked like a, a fit for, for Denver. We've always played fast. We've always played up and down. And, uh, and so I remember telling Tim, I was like, Tim, I was like, just put the kid in the, in the starting lineup. I was like, I'll never tell them what to do, but we got to put the kid in the starting lineup. And that empowered Coach Malone to be able to really get behind, you know, certain decisions that he needed to make. And that put us on the trajectory of you know Nikola Jokic, the franchise player today. There's a little detail. We call it Jokmas, by the way. December fifteenth. Yeah. We know. I've we heard it. Every I've year. heard it called that. I know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that, you know, it's, that's a it's, DNVR original. I, I mean, that's Jokmas. Mary Jokmas. It's a sacred day around here. It, it is. Trust me, I, I get it, under, and I understand for a lot of reasons. But yeah, that was uh, <laughs> that was a fun day because it, it was myself talking to Tim, talking to Coach Malone, and the three of us got on the same page, and we're like, "You're empowered to go do what we think yeah. we need to do." And that's an organization communicating and figuring out because there's probably going to be a short-term setback. You might lose a few more games, but eventually it's going yeah. to take hold. Well, I mean, you talk about meddling, though, there. And an owner, I, I my outside look is that it does feel like the Kroenke ownership group meddles less than most ownership groups. Some people, it sounds like, are nonstop there. But there are moments when you have to kind of step in. Like, how, yeah. how do you balance, all right, is it a big deal? When you or your dad come down and say, "Hey, here's something we got to do," you know, I was uh, I was a lot more hands on earlier in my career. Um, I mean, like I said, my first meeting was to fly to Baltimore and have have Carmelo asked to be traded, and so that first eight months was like a baptism by fire for both Masai and myself. Going through that, where Twitter was, you know, a couple years old, things are getting leaked to the media. <laughs> Next thing you know, ten minutes later, it's online. No one's checking their facts. You know, misrepresented facts then become a the story facts? the following day. <laughs> it was a mess. And so, um, you know, really, uh, out of the Carmelo thing, I just learned how to keep organizations much tighter as well. Mm. And so you don't, you know, when by the time Tim arrived in 2013, we talked about when we ma mapped out our strategy, um, and that include keeping a lot of information in-house. Um, but but to, your, to your comment about meddling, um, you know, it always comes back to understanding the why of certain decisions and, and trusting your people that you have. And I think that, you know, to, to reel in the, the part about patience as well, um, if you're going to set a, set a certain trajectory for your organization and chart a path that you think would work, you need to stick to it. And you need to understand the duration of the period that you're charting for that, that you know, specific reason that you're heading that direction. Whether if it's going young, you need to understand that if you're going to draft a Nikola Jokic and a Jamal Murray, those guys are teenagers. And they're not going to be finished products by the time they're 22 years old. And so no matter how little or how much success you think you might be having, you need to be able to you know, grit your teeth. And there was a couple years in there where our goal was, our stated goal was to make the playoffs. And then you had Russell Westbrook hitting a shot out of his wazoo yeah. Right. Yeah, I remember in a that. one year. That and then the following to crowd year. Went to wild. a standing ovation. Oh. Yeah, to the crowd. Crowd. <laughs> that was an absolute. We've come a long way. We've come a long way. Backbreaker. Yeah. I mean, what an amazing play by, what an, by such an amazing player. Reggie Jackson had the assist on that player. Oh, now, don't tell Reggie, me. Reggie. I didn't want that one. <laughs> it's okay. He's with us now. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then the following year, we missed it by a game. Um, to Minnesota and then that was the first and I've, I've talked about this too and I'm sure you guys have that was the first real glimpse of the Jamal and Nicola show right was game 82 in 2017 and was that 18 17 mm -hmm. 18 18 17 18 season yeah, yeah. 17 18 season and um, that was you know the play in before the play in it was randomly that we, we played Minnesota with the exact same record at the end of the year and I was really excited because that's the closest thing you can come to a playoff atmosphere. And as you guys know, um, anyone around the NBA knows, as much as the regular season is the regular season, the playoffs are just a different animal. And mm -hmm. you don't get that experience until you get there. Yep. And so I just, our stated goal was to make the playoffs because I just wanted those guys to feel what that intensity was like. And they got it for one game. And the bad news was that we lost. We lost in overtime to a, an up and coming Minnesota Timberwolves team that had Jimmy Butler, Carl Anthony Towns. Um, and, uh, and it was a, but it was a good test for our guys. And as that game came down the stretch and went to overtime, the guys that were grabbed and seized that game by the neck and made plays were Jamal and Nicola. And so we came back to the locker room and everybody's a little bit down and yeah, I, I felt down too, but as you know, trying to be the optimist of the moment, 
um, I remember turning to Coach Malone and Tim, and I was just like, you guys, I was like, everybody take a breath because we are going to be really effing good someday. Because mm -hmm. those two guys that were making those plays are going to be with us for a long time. And if they continue on that trajectory, we could really have something special. And that was the last year we missed the playoffs, and we haven't looked back since. Yeah. What do you think is the most important job that you take on with the organization? Of all the different ways you, you, you touch the organization, what's the most important? Um, just providing calmness and guidance when I can. Because um, everybody gets into, I mean, whenever anybody usually contacts me, there's something very important going on that requires immediate attention, you know, or at least if we're talking about a player contract, you have a little bit of, you know, time to converse about it. But um, it's just making sure that everybody's on the same page and, and calm, keeping everything calm. Um, and also knowing that you're there in support, um, whether that's just sticking my head in before or after practice, popping into a road trip whenever I can, um, or, you know, coming down to the locker room and just saying hi to guys. Um, because you just want to let them know that you care. Um, just like our fans, they want to know that we're fans too. And I think that our players, um, in particular, and our coaches, they just, they're humans. They want to know that, that everybody in the organization is pulling for them. And um, I think that they know that my dad, you guys see my dad around all the time. I'm around in the background quite a bit. And, you know, it's just putting an arm around guys when they need it and patting them on the butt when they need it. I, I want to kind of throw this one to Eric because, you know, one thing, all the different things that an ownership group does, a president mm -hmm. does, Branding, yes. marketing, yes. promotion, how the team presents itself is a big one to us. We're a company Absolutely. very big on those things, and I imagine ownership's big there. Yeah, I mean, we got the sense from the outside that this latest rebrand of the Denver Nuggets, you had a lot to do with. It seemed like yeah. it was something that was close to your heart. It was. Uh, it's something that's close to my heart as well. Take me through what it looks like to rebrand a team in this way. Like, how, how is the league involved? How are third-party partners like Nike involved? Yeah, um, it actually, that's a, it's a great question. Um, and uh, I was very heavily involved in that uh, because I knew that the, I had talked to enough people, including you guys um, at different times and, and fans, you know, throughout the course of the time I arrived in Denver in 2007. Uh, I think that the, the powder blue and uh, some of the marks that we had from 2003 until we made the change a few years ago, um, they identified with a different era of Nuggets basketball. And I could clearly see that a new era of Nuggets basketball mm. was coming. Love that. And um, I wanted to try to figure it out a way to modernize the look, bring it up a little more contemporary, but also give a nod to some of the, the, the colors and marks that we've had in the past, uh, including um, the, the rainbow skyline. And uh, it actually got delayed by a year because we were going through a switch from Adidas to Nike. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we, when we finally landed on... Um, some of the designs we had. I wanted a, you know, and I'm not sure how you guys feel about our basic home in a way, uh, but I wanted a very distinct, very classic kind of feel. And once we got the shorts right with the kind of the mountain look on the sides, um, then it became very easy because I was like, I don't want a very loud jersey. I feel like I want something that people can identify with and I want something they can wear as a, as a T-shirt or as a jersey. And then we can have some fun with some of the other ones. And then that's where the Mile High City uh, mm -hmm. look Which came is from. our all-time favorite. favorite. Yeah, we good. I'm glad you guys like that one. Because uh, they, they asked me what they thought they, that should go on our third. And I was like, there's no question about it. It has to say Mile High City. Mm. It has, we have to acknowledge Perfect. the Mile High somehow. And when they came back with the first design, we tweaked it a few different ways. Um, and simplified it. And that's where the, the current look kind of came from. So the current logo the main logo started off as a secondary logo in correct the years that led up to this i've heard stories that it was you guys tried to push it through but were thwarted is, it, is there anything the, to that the, 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 the main this, that this one you're wearing main, yeah this main crest because it or the the roundel mm -hmm. but it started off yeah, as the, the secondary logo, logo yeah it was a secondary mark on our previous look i think um, but our primary now, I mean, is basically that with like a little bit of Denver Nuggets, I yeah. think, around it. Mm -hmm. And then our secondary is like the modified, like, like updated skyline. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I really, I mean, if it was up to me, 
I would have the original skyline as our logo. Like, so is it not up to you? It, well, <laughs> it's a very. <laughs> yeah. We gotta find the guy that's up to. <laughs> Let's just out him right now. Because I, Let's because just say, I use that sentence a lot, but it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say that there's a lot of opinions when it comes to logos yes. and marks. Yes. And some of which are, um, you know, different partners. Yes. And things of that nature that I that they're opinions that you have to weigh. And we thought that, you know, updating the pickaxe and, and moving to a, a darker blue, um, a little deeper gold, along with uh, the burgundy that we kind of had from the 90s, mm -hmm. um, would, would be a great look. And then the way that they, that, that they appeased me was to work in the modified new rainbow um, and come out with those white jerseys alongside yes. of it like we had a few years ago. And, I love and it. Uh, I, as I have stated many times and, you know, through our corporate partners, um, they they've had different designs that they'd like to do over the years, but I have uh, I've been in their ear and, and hopefully you'll be seeing the rainbow again very soon in the future. Oh, so, really? Okay. All right, we're all right. <laughs> so <laughs> not not this season though. <laughs> well, so that leads into yeah. the next question. I didn't say near future. I said future. But the, the rainbow, the, future, okay. the rainbow is part of uh, of Nuggets lore and, and it needs to be clear and present at all times as far as I'm concerned. I mean, when you guys come to the locker room, it's not our it's not that crest. It's our old. It's, mm. it's the original right. skyline that you know I, I see yeah. around here a couple places. Yeah, it's yeah. the original logo from 1970, 80, whatever right. it was. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that leads into the next question, which is very prescient to today. Nike's role in these third jerseys, the way that we're every year mm -hmm. releasing a new jersey, um, building the library of what it means to have a Nuggets jersey. What is their role versus the team's role? How does this go about? Like, what is the design process when Nike is involved in making a new jersey for your team each year? Mm -hmm. um, well, you have the you know, the primary home and away, mm -hmm. uh, the white and the navy that we have, and then you have the mile high, which is like a slightly different blue. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I was ready to go with a blue skyline, but I, did, I, I agreed with, with certain points that were made. Um, in year three, I was ready to go for a blue skyline. Can I give you some advice? Absolutely. Go for a blue skyline. That would be incredible. <laughs> um, but then we have three blue jerseys. Uh, that and, our colors are blue. And, and I, I get it. <laughs> like I get it. We Trust have three me, I, I get it. Orange jerseys for the Broncos. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you have your home, primary home and away, and there's a big process to go through and adjust those, and that is something that requires different levels of approval throughout the league. And it's a multi-year process because they don't want teams to be cycling through jerseys and yes. looks every year. Um, and then you, you have your third, which is your city edition. I don't know the, um, I forget what they There's call the it, statement. but the, the mile the high. The I think it's yeah. technically the statement. Yeah, the mile high yeah. is, is, is something that we're always going to keep. And then the fourth one Love rotates. That. And that's where we've been able to have some fun with the white and black skyline. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a burgundy jersey one year. Um, and then we they did the NBA 75th where we actually didn't have a – a much of a say in it. What they did was they combined a lot of our favorite, like through 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 different solicitations from fans. They combined a lot of our favorite looks, incurring, including the font that's on your hat, mm -hmm. um, right. and uh, like a little bit of rainbow along the. But it was it was a cool look. And then we're kind of going back to um, you know something fifty two eighty base to show the mile high. And then uh, I've been been very vocal about the need for another rainbow though. So all right, uh, nice. hopefully you guys will be seeing one again soon. Uh, what one one Wait, please? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, he'll never talk to me again. So I need to. <laughs> I need to get this. In. What is, What is the What is the organization's feeling on Maxi the Miner? Maxi the Miner is my favorite part. Yeah, of you should Nuggets tip your floor. hand there. I like how you led the witness. Well, I'm just. I. Uh, I'm just saying. Like, I don't know if there's any. Like, I. I feel like Maxi had the biggest moment of the championship. I saw him on hats. I saw, saw him on Michael Malone's arm. I saw him on Michael Malone's <laughs> arm. What, wh you'll you'll always live? see him on Michael yeah. Malone's <laughs> arm. He's there permanently. Yeah, he's there yeah, permanently where does Maxi live in, in the, the pantheon of Nuggets marks in your, in your mind? I love Maxi the Mike. Let's go. Yeah, I love Maxi <laughs> the Shut the it down, Kale. I got what I needed. And, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. Um, we talked about where the trophy was going to go. Originally, I was going to have a Maxi statue there. <laughs> um, for the, for the, as for a little bit of good luck for the players to rub as they came on, oh, and, man. Oh, and then wow. and then I, I I thought about it and I was like, I think it'd be a little funny to have a little. Josh, I'm going to give you my um, personal phone number. <laughs> you text me when you have thoughts like this, and I'll tell you if they're good or not. That's a great idea. You yeah. should have gone through with it. It's like a college I even had a little tradition. like clay clay sculpture done oh so God. I could see what it would have looked like. And the 3D version was cool, but like I in my mind I was like, this could look. 
cool or it could look really Dude, out it of place. It must be so fun to own yeah. a team because you can just think of this stuff. To do. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, it'd be cool. Do it. All right. You know, in all sincerity, though, you know, the Warriors, they have Benny Gold. They have yeah. the lo local artist designs help them stuff. Mm -hmm. Here in Denver, we have D-Line. So I'm just saying, we got a guy over here. There's literally designing. no difference. There's there really is no, no difference. difference. He's basically the Benny Gold of, of, of Colorado. Uh, let's take a break. On the other side, I know you guys want to talk about, we want to get into the future of this team. We want to talk about KSE, the innovative, innovative company. We want to talk about the Altitude Comcast thing. I know you guys want to get to that. but And also, the future of this team, the team is talking dynasty. They're talking that their goals have now reached hires. Ownership thinking the same thing. We'll talk about that. Ooh. Kind love, excited to be an official partner of DNVR and, and support another local brand. Um, if you guys haven't checked them out yet, check out the Kind Love Immaculate Vibes joints mm. with the DNVR NUX mm. logo on it. Right there, you can see it on the screen. Use code DNVR for 25% off in store. Uh, they've got locations in Cherry Creek or North Denver. Mention DNVR, get the DNVR exclusive discount 25% off. All kind love flower pre rolls in their turbo joint line. You can also use code DNVR for 25% off in store. Those turbo, those joint packs, the DNVR Immaculate Vibes packs, $25 a pack. So get on those. Unless you, you use the code DNVR and you enact the 25% discount. It's a lot cheaper. of 25. I can't do on. the math. It's cheaper, though. Also, check out Breckenridge Brewery, the official beer of DNVR. Check out the Broncos Country Pale Ale, the beer of the month here at the DNVR bar. Stop in, get one. Got it on tap. Uh, if you don't know where to get Breck Brew, check out the Breck Brew Beer Locator. Just type in your zip code. Tells you exactly where to get Breck Brew. Uh, Breckenridge Brewery is the official beer of DNVR. And finally, become a DNVR diehard. You get a discount at the DNVR bar. You get discount on merch. You get a discount on the events that we do, the tailgates, the takeovers, tons of those coming up for Nuggets games here. Um, so go to thednvr.com, click on Become a Die Hard, and you get $7 a month. You get automatically signed up for Harrison Wynn's new magnum opus, the DNVR Daybreak. Yes. The newsletter that Harrison Wynn is now in charge of that you can get everything you need to know delivered directly to your inbox you every can. morning. Harrison Wind is a treasure, and what better way than to start your day than with Harrison Wind? Couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, by, by the way, it's a big deal. This is a big deal. It it's is a really a big, big piece of content that you now get right from Harrison Wind, a new project of his. So, First one went out today. First one went out. We good? We back? All right, we're back here um, with Josh Kroenke. Now, obviously, one of the big stories, I mean, the biggest story is the Nuggets winning a championship, having a Nikola Jokic, Jamal Murray. I think yeah. I'm going to go ahead and say that's the number one <laughs> what about story. Ariana? But another yeah. big story line has been that Altitude Television has been sort of the first RSN to fall, so to speak, in the battle between the cable companies, the cable providers. You've been at the heart of this. You've spoken to it a lot. But I want to ask you specifically, at Media Day, you were asked about the Jazz and the Suns, mm -hmm. who have presented new models. And you said there's something it's intriguing. You're watching what they're doing, but that the circumstance for you is different. What's intriguing about it and what is different about it for the Denver market? Um, that's a good question. And you're right. I did say all that stuff. <laughs> 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 Thank you for bringing it up. Um, no, but I mean, it's a it's obviously a hot button topic and it needs to be discussed. Um, you know, I think that the first thing that 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 I need to try to you know, articulate is that, you know, this is, this is the most painful thing that, that goes on in, in my, my world right now. Uh, and it has been for years, uh, you know, it's, I've personally put a lot of time and effort into, you know, uh, the Nuggets and Avalanche and to see them, you know, reaching their peaks, um, where a lot of people can't get the games on, on their, on their television is, is, is just painful. Um, because I want them to be able to see our teams. I want them to see what I what I what we get to see, uh, you know, and easy. Um, but you know, right away I can just say that, um, you know, at this point, you know, it might be that that fans think it's it's lip service. Um, but you know, we're we're dealing with a, a two hundred billion dollar company um, that's trying to change the way it's done business on the fly, and you know, that's that's a, a crazy way of putting it, but. Um, I don't know if anybody here has, has cut the cord or, you know, I mean, some, some consumers are, are consuming their, their television and their media in very different ways. And when you talk about um, Utah and Phoenix, 
Um, they're, they are, you know, NBA teams that went through their own issues, um, but they had the, uh, the liberty of their, their RSN actually being dissolved and going off the air. Mm. Um, and they, they were able to create solutions out of that. And for us, we're in a unique position where, you know, altitude, you know, even though it's a, a struggle for some people to get, if you have Comcast as, as, as a carrier, it still is a network that exists. It still is in production. It's still producing all of our games and it still can be found on other carriers. And um, so if we were to just turn the lights off on altitude, a lot of good people would lose their jobs and while, while we figured out a way to try to bring this out of the ground. And so um, we just met with Comcast again in Philly uh, very recently. Um, we think we're working towards a decent solution, um, but you know everything is, is similar yet different. And there's actually, uh, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to read the article yet because it actually just ran today. I haven't um, seen it. On, Tim yeah, Buntemps, yeah. Yeah, on ESPN.com. So anybody out there um, that's listening right now, please please check out the article on ESPN.com. They do a really good job kind of summing up um, the R regional sports network, the RSN situation around uh, the NBA because it's it's permeating other sports as well. Um, Altitude is something that is, uh, is wholly owned by my family. And so without having a giant partner like a Comcast or another um, – uh, another entity, uh, we were kind of the canary in the coal mine a few years ago. And, you know, as you look out over the linear TV landscape, no one can figure out how to make the model work moving from linear TV to streaming. And we are, are, are sucked up in that and, and part of that, unfortunately. We're working very hard to try to figure it out. And like I said, I know it might be lip service, but we really are trying to find a solution. And it's, it's not just not as simple as, as people might want to make it. So I've been, I've been, my perspective on this, I've always been pretty charitable when I'm looking at this because I look at it and I go, this is a big, this is a bigger thing. Denver was kind of yeah. first. And, that's, and, now you're and that's what the article else. today on ESPN does. I mean, there's right. there's a bankruptcy going on with, with Diamond Sports Group involving 15 right. RSNs yep. around yeah. the league. I mean, it's it's a, it's if, you really, league if you wide. really look around and, and understand, it's this is not a Denver thing. This is a national thing on, right. in all places and in other sports as well. But here's the thing I think about mm -hmm. because I look at – KSC, the Kroenke, Kroenke ownership, three That's championships in a row between Rams, Avs, now Nuggets. A lot of good mammoth. things. Oh man, I mammoth. forgot the mammoth there. I forgot about it. <laughs> There's been a lot. We talked about patience earlier. I've heard from a lot of employees with no reason to tell me these things that they run like a family organization, very tight knit. You talk about this. I think there's we try a, to be. not meddling. These are like big things that are really important for ownership group. I don't know that I would call KSC innovative. And I wonder if That's this fair. is a moment where innovation becomes the most important thing. Because I don't know that there's a solve out there that's just like coming down the pike. That, that's the thing I wonder. Mm -hmm. No, I think, you know, and that's, that's a fair assessment. Um, you know, as we sit in, you know, our different press conferences, and I think, you know, you guys have a great perspective on, on the Nuggets and how me and my family like to conduct business. But, you know, whether it's a practice facility or, you know, the, the RSN thing, we are trying to, to get things done. Sometimes it's an advantage to be the size and scale that we are, and sometimes it's a disadvantage. And to piggyback off of what you said, I think that that's a challenge for us is that we need to get more innovative in certain areas. We need to be able to think on our feet and be able to say, hey, you know, when you know, the local media landscape is starting to change just slightly, we have a lot of exposure. We're 100% owned by, by a single entity and a single person and my father. And, you know, we, we are structured differently. What is our exposure in other areas and how can we be proactive instead of reactive? Right. You know, you start to talk about, um, you know, being being progressive. Um, and I say it's about being more proactive instead of being reactive. And we need to be proactive with our thoughts on our commercial side, our media side and our team side. And I think if you're proactive instead of being reactive, you can solve a lot of problems before they start. This is just such a big issue. Like the the, the media thing, it's not a small. And I, and I apologize directly to everybody that can't get our games. They are available in other places. You know, you have to right. go look for them. So we're not just a, like I said, an RSN that's been shut off the shut off completely because we're still in operation. And yeah. maybe it would be cleaner that way. Right. Um, but you know, it is it is available on Directv and other networks. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, it's just a it's a mess. It's it an is, issue yeah. across the entire NBA yeah. now and it yeah. seems like it's actually like getting worse by the season. I yeah. am curious to see though just because I don't think that there's going to be a solution handed. That's my this is my assessment mm -hmm. again. I just yes. don't feel like one's being handed. I feel yeah. like somebody's going to crack a code and that fan base is going to be the one that benefits the most from yeah. it and and that organization hopefully there's like a profitable one because obviously that'll make it more sustainable. Absolutely. And that's that you're looking for sustainability long term and where does that where does that 
kind of rubber meet the road in the middle of all that. I mean, from from Disney to Paramount Plus to you know you know Netflix and all these other companies that are that have these these amazing streamable services. You know, how can how can sports best plug into that type of marketplace? Um, so people, many, I mean, the entire ecosystem of sports is used to turning on their TV and being able to consume right. it through turning it to channel whatever. And, you know, whether it's the English Premier League that we're involved with um, on Peacock, um, you know, the NBA through the NBA app or through TNT when it's on a national game, you're, or the, you know, the NFL now Sunday tickets now on YouTube TV, mm -hmm. you're jumping between different services that are kind of speaking the same language when it comes to streaming, but fans are used to being able to go to one place to right. find all that stuff. So eventually does that turn into some sort of a bundle that Fort sports fans can 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 buy into i'm not 100 percent sure but people are trying to figure it out people much smarter than i and it does affect a lot of people i mean i know like young people it's always like we can yeah. figure out how to get things going like we do young people know what they're doing but i do right. have a lot of aunts and uncles that they're asking me about the nuggets you know what's going on with the nuggets like i used to watch every game and it's hey well you can get fubo what's that i have no idea and so the some of the solves right now i just it really does touch i think a lot more people you yeah. know it's a, it's a huge amount of people no. that are, are sort of affected by absolutely it. i mean i i know from from firsthand experience when i arrived in denver um you know i my my family bought into the teams in early 2000s we won the stanley cup in 2001 um, and I learned a lot from Pierre Lacroix when I first uh, moved to Denver about team building. And you know, you, to learn from a guy like that who built two champions in a very short amount of time, fortunately I've been able to pick some great minds over the years, including his. Um, but there was a lot of Avalanche fans you know, from that 01 championship all through you know, the lockout of 05 up until a few years ago. When you win those championships, the, the nostalgia that it's created out of those right. experiences oh builds a fan base that lasts decades. Yeah. And if you're not prepared to capitalize on that, then you're shooting yourselves in the foot. And it's not lost on me that we could be missing out on a lot of young men and women around Denver that don't have the chance to see yeah. see the Nuggets yeah. and Avalanche play. I mean, play. that's, that's yeah. something yeah. we've talked about yeah, it lasts a lot. Yeah. Generations. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. My, I mean, my, that's, that's, that's why it's like, I, I, I personally and, and my, my father and all the people that went into to building these teams here in Denver, it's a, it's, it's not lost on me, and I, I very much mean that when I say it's it's a painful, painful subject for us. I, I will say on the generational thing, it was cool to come into Ball Arena as a Lakers fan for basically my whole existence and kind of do the thing. And one of the best parts about this playoffs was it was a very shameful experience to come into Ball Arena in the playoffs. Was, you saw a lot of Lakers fans kind of just kind of wait. Did you say you came in as a Lakers no, fan? No, 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 right. not for me. Yeah, yeah. Right. That was phrased very confusing. Yeah. 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 Rehash what was said you there. That like <laughs> <story> <laughs> you were a no, I'm just fan. saying that it was very comfortable experience to go it's into Ball like, Arena as, as a Lakers fan. Cool People were like, you know, put your feet up, and I just it was fun watching the shift throughout the year of like. Oh, I don't actually fit in anymore here. Yeah, it's actually right. uncomfortable. Well, ever to be since here. that coach said, "Take that L on the way out," oh, it's, it's like the, got a little more hostile. <laughs> yeah, it's been yeah. it's been fantastic. Yeah. I want to ask though. <laughs> so you win a Super Bowl, you get a Stanley Cup, and now you get a Larry O'Brien. And I don't know what it's called for the mammoth. Do you know what the trophy's called? Uh, they have a name for it. Um, I, I should have done <laughs> this. This is such this a bad, is bad, 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 bad question. Bad job of putting him on the spot. No, I mean, this. trust me. I I, I mean, I. <sighs> And it's on the tip of my tongue because I, so I, Google I made sure yeah, look at I made sure when out. we when we did the the 2022 Stanley Cup, and yeah. we actually we did Super Bowl in February, we did the Mammoth in in May, and then we did the Avalanche in June. Yeah, and so. Uh, yeah, that, that's what I thought. I'm like, I was like, I thought it was very basic because when I had it in front of me, there's not a better name. It doesn't have a name honoring like um, a great. You should call it the Josh Cronky. <laughs> yeah. Josh Cronky. <laughs> Definitely not that one. Um, no, but well, I want to get to this question for you though. Of just Chris Paul had the hilarious comment a couple years back where he said he was addicted to going to the to the finals, <laughs> and we clown him now for it because what do we else? What else is sports for except for the clown addicting. your enemies? I, I I believe everything that in that statement. But this is very what I was accurate. gonna. This is what you, I was gonna you ask get you. Get to shake your addiction. Well, you're a sick man yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's very addictive <laughs> we're just feeding him but honestly has it changed you at all this run is there anything that's kind of changed and and maybe even provided more motivation of hey this the mountaintop's kind of great um yes i think that that you know when you have a taste of success uh i've read books about this uh but you have the disease of more yeah um and so you always want more and how do you go about trying to to get more and um, but you have to do you have to do that with a sense of perspectives that 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 involves humility, and the one thing that that being able to 
um, be in a position where all of a sudden you had teams. I mean, my, my, for me individually, when we started on this project with the Nuggets and Avs, you know, 10 years ago, uh, it was to have them built in, in certain ways. And I don't care when they're reaching their peaks as long as you can try to, try to, to reach that, that goal. But about 2015, 16, uh, and then actually, you know, I was later than that, 2017, I could really start to see the Avs. The Avs made the first or second round. Um, Kale was on board by then. You could really see that we had added another special player to the mix. Nathan was starting to hit a new level physically um, uh, and emotionally as well. Like you could see him starting to grow into a, a, a man. And on the basketball side, Jamal and Nicola were really starting to take shape along with a few others. And so it was like, wow, we have these two really good teams coming out of the ground. I would love it. It'd be really cool to, for them to advance in the playoffs deep together. Yeah. Um, I never thought they would win, uh, you know, trophies in, you know, the span of 12 months of each other. Um, but now a new goal has been set and I have set it to both of them guys. The only thing left to do is do it both in the same year. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> and, um, you know, the cool thing I heard, I heard Kale McCarr talking that a few of the guys were on a text message chain after the, av after the, the, the nuggets won. And they're like, it'd be fun to go do that again, guys. Let's, yeah. let's, let's get yeah. it together. And I think you can see from their start right now. I mean, they're, they're, they're serious. They might um, go 82 and 0. I don't know. <laughs> At the moment, it's on the table. It's on but the honestly, table. like, look, billionaires have just about anything they want. So then you have to start compare the things you can't buy. Is there at the billionaires club when you get together with with the guys? Is there a little bit of a hey? Did you guys see that? I got another one. Did you see that? <laughs> I did it again. Like I said, this, this this the second that you start taking it for granted or start start chirping a little bit is the second it won't happen again. Right, so like right. being being able to do them all in such a sp short period of time where they all kind of coalesce and you kind of especially the one from, you know, February to, to May to the Avs winning at the end of June. Um, it was it was a whirlwind. And so by the time that the Nuggets were coming around 12 months later, uh, I was texting with uh, a friend of mine. And uh, the, as I was about to go down for the game, he's like, how you feeling about tonight? And I was like, you know, I said, if we win, I'm going to wake up tomorrow. If we lose, I'm going to wake up tomorrow. <laughs> I wasn't and going to. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, 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 I get it. I mean, they're, they're a little personally. bit of fun. Um, but, you know, and, and the, the basketball one in particular, because it had never been done in Denver before, and because of my, my experience as a player, and, and the Nuggets was where I cut my teeth uh, learning the business, you know, and we talked about, you know, telling the whole story from, you know, when I took over in 2010, up through Masai to Tim uh, to now Calvin. Um, and I can fill in every gap along the way of how we actually reached that point and got to that trophy. Um, but it was especially, especially personal to me because so many people around uh, the NBA and around, and, and it wasn't a negative, but a lot of fans even, like, you know, I'd come down as we were starting to rebuild the team and people would say, you know, Josh, you, why, did you, why did you blow up that 57 win team in 2013? It was so much fun to watch. Like, we're just, we just wanna see good basketball. And, and I would look him in the eye and I would, I would kind of put my arm around him and I would say, I just, I know we can do more. And um, it may not be, you know, clear as, you know, right in front of it, but I, I always had a vision of how it could be done. And um, so to reach that one in particular, finally going into that last game, you know, I, I thought we were gonna do it in game five. Um, but, you know, a lot of things can happen. And, you know, in, to, to rewind, rewind, which is why I had the experience and, and probably the perspective that I did going into game five for the Nuggets was the Avalanche were in the exact same position 12 months prior. We had a game five coming back here. Uh, we were actually, um, um, yeah, we came back here for game five, up three games to one. Mm -hmm. yep. And on a Friday night, and that ball arena was <laughs> as loud as you can, you can have it. It was better. It was. It was. It was, it was better that it was in hockey, Game Five at home. Yeah, hockey fans. Hockey fans were loud that night, and Tampa Bay Lightning, being champions that they were, came uh -huh. out and and beat us. And and so we had to go down and win the thing in Game Six in their place. Mm -hmm. And that so for the Nuggets heading into Game Five, I knew that was going to be an all out all out war. And from the from the from the tip, you could tell the referees swallowed their whistle. And that's why I think you know mm -hmm. some of our Nuggets teams in the past would win a lot of games with, you know, 120 to 110. When I thought this group might really have a chance is when we started to win games, you know, when, when the scoring was much lower, it was sure. the defensive games, and we were playing through teams. And sure enough, when it comes to game five in the NBA Finals, when the referees are going to swallow their whistle, and you have a brilliant coach in Eric Spolstra, 
you know, commanding a defense of Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo, along with others flying all over the place, switching, calling out. It was going to be a dogfight, and our guys were ready. They were able to play through it and play a style that won that game, and yeah. the rest is history. Yeah. I get this. You have, yeah. I, here's a question for you. Mm-hmm. Michael Malone and, and Cal have been talking about how how they've built this team and are continuing to build it, and they haven't been shy about throwing out the word dynasty. Like that's been a word that Michael Malone said. That's been a word that Calvin Booth has said, and that's been reflected in you know, going into the draft this summer, getting three guys, signing them to standard contracts, them being on the roster. I mean the the. D word dynasty is is that being talked about you know with you guys behind the scenes as much as it it seems like well we have a we have a championship team um coming off coming off their first championship uh, returning all five starters uh we did lose a key six man uh in bruce brown and we're gonna miss him uh we also lost um, a great player and a great veteran jeff green um and a few other guys around the periphery of that group um, that was able to, to eventually get us to win the championship. Um, but, you know, to have a dynasty, um, which I've heard being discussed, and I'm not afraid of the word um, because I think, I think we're good enough to, to go try to win it again this year. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, back to the disease of more, how are we going to go about that? We're going to have a target on our back. Everyone knows that Nicola is the best player in the league, hands down, right now. Um, and are we going to be able to cope with that for 82 games? Uh, and so there's, it's, a, it's a different approach that we're going to have to have if we're going to have to have success. We're going to find success. Um, and so I'm not scared of the dynasty word, but um, to your point about Coach Malone and Calvin, uh, you know, the rules, we, we, we built this team with sustainability in mind, being able to control our own decisions, our own players. Um, and uh, the rules changed on the fly. Uh, and right. so when, when the new CBA came in recently, we had to really study it and understand how it was going to affect us and our planning moving forward. And I think that Cal made some good, good sound decisions um, because as much as we wanted to re-sign Bruce, we couldn't. You couldn't. We, we, yeah. we, we literally could not re-sign Bruce because we knew teams were going to go to a place and offer a first-year salary that the rules simply wouldn't allow right. us to right. do. I don't care how far in the tax. My dad could have said, I don't care what it takes, do whatever. And we yeah. still, we don't have those exceptions to be able to go that high based on where our team salaries are. And, and those rules are in place for a reason, to, right. try, to, to try to break teams apart and, and force you to make decisions. And so what that did was that forced us into the draft and it forced us to look at a few guys. Um, and we, I think we made a trade. I was, we were in Miami, Calvin calls me, let's go have lunch, we go down. He's like, hey, we gotta make a trade. I'm like, hey, we got game four coming up here in a few yeah. minutes, buddy. And, uh, and so we made that trade, got back into the draft, and we picked up a couple of good young players that um, really fit what we're trying to do right now. And um, you know, when you're building the team and going through the development period, I think you look at players and draft picks slightly differently than we are now. Right. And I think you guys can see that in our strategy over the last year or two. So just the last question for me, and as a follow-up to that, mm-hmm. you mentioned the rules change. Going to be very expensive to have a dynasty now, especially yeah. if Jamal makes all NBA. Yeah. So part of these talks is the back end of the roster getting prepared for that. But Absolutely. does that mean that have there been conversations about, hey, the front part of this roster is going to be expensive no matter what to keep this thing going and we're prepared? Yeah, I mean, we are prepared and, you know, we're going to do our best to try to hold this thing together because Jamal is and you see it in his eyes this year. He's, Jamal is an all NBA player. I'm shocked he hasn't been an all star yet. Um, I think we've known how good he is. Um, it's just a matter of him getting healthy at the right time. And, you know, he may not have been in a place to make an all-star team last year, which I probably disagreed with. I thought we should have had three. Um, but I think, you know, now everyone, there's, it's very apparent how good Jamal Murray is. Yeah. And I think he should be all, not only an, an, you know, an all-star this year, I think he's all-NBA quality player. And so we're going to be forced with some decisions because there are some rules in place, especially at the high end, um, it's not even a tax issue anymore. When you talk, start talking about the second apron and involving, you know, if you're over that second apron for a certain amount of period, for a certain period of years, you're talking about forfeiting draft picks and pushing those picks out to the end of rounds. And like, so you have teams that can generate revenue to pay whatever penalties they want and teams, you know, maybe you're willing to do that. But when you start talking about draft picks and, and a really harder end at the, at the end of the salary spectrum on, on, the, team, on the team scale, you, 
you really get people's attention. And I think that's going to come into play. Uh, fortunately, not for the next year or two, but we're already planning for the future in that as well. Well, there you go. The yeah. dynasty already has the plans laid for the next five years. There you go. Well, at least as long as Nicole is here, Jamal are here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the plan is still give it to Jamal and Nicola and try to hold these guys together as much as we can. It's a pretty a simple plan. plan. I think that's a good plan. Pretty good plan. I think that's the right plan. I had the same plan, yeah. actually. So. If, the ball's, if the ball's in Nicola's hands and Jamal's hands, something good is usually going to happen. Yeah. And yeah. and the guys, the good news is, is the guys around them have been playing you know, for a number of years together now. And I think that the most underrated aspect of pro sports is continuity. Yeah. And that was a goal of ours on the front end was to try to develop, you know, one, you know, draft and develop a couple of all-stars, hold, to get, hold them together through continuity and see what, see what you can achieve. Well, Josh, thanks for coming in to our yeah. studio. Unbelievable. Talking, uh, My you pleasure, know, guys. touching on a lot of subjects um, I know fans wanted to hear about. Anything else? I mean, this is a piece of cake so far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, just, okay, quickly, quickly. What, you hear rapid people, fire ones? Not, rapid not a fire. Uni, not Let's a go uniform, rapid fire. Uniform, I'm almost done with my beer, so rapid well, fire. I'm just curious. You hear people talk about what it is to be an owner, what you guys are doing wrong. What do you think people get it wrong the most about your mm. role, the world you live in, the decisions you can make, all, all of this stuff? Um, that it doesn't affect me on a personal level. Mm. Uh, you guys... You guys are around this this team and this organization very closely, and you know I think we all know each other, but we may not we may not be close friends. But I mean, until I, now, I, I read yeah, exactly until now. Until now, we've had, we've had a beer together. We're, we're doing we're doing friends. great. Are you kidding me? <laughs> we're doing great. Um, but you know, there's there's a very personal aspect to this, and um, you know whether it's players, coaches, you, you you try not to get too attached, and I've gotten you know, it, but it's impossible for me. Um, my, my heart and soul is behind this stuff and you know it's, it, there's no reason that I didn't I mean I was crying my eyes out when we finally won the thing I turned around and I'm, I'm involved with my father you know I know that you know there's the scale at which our businesses operate on sometimes make people seem like we're you know we operate any differently but to, to win a championship with my dad meant the world to me um, and you know when like when 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 Tim left um, tough situation i think you guys know how close tim and i are and still are to this day but i have to build an organization where if i lose a key person i need to have the next available person or an idea of where i might go and i can't be afraid of those decisions and so when we sit down there for you know a press conference where i'm promoting calvin up because i think he can do a great job and now i think you guys know calvin well enough to know what the job he can do um it's it is tough because there is a human level to it all and um, I don't I don't lose sight of that, which is I think makes for a successful organization because at the end of the day people know we care and you know it, it was in that press conference where everybody was sitting there looking at me kind of a little bit cross-eyed because because Tim left and I looked you guys in the eye and that was January or excuse me June of 2021 right before the abs are get, 2022 right before the abs are getting ready to win and I said championship or bust yep. And, and, and I, I said it. I we said didn't it. bust. I said it. You know, <laughs> it I said it. And, uh, and, you know, if you have Nicole on the roster, it's championship or bust. And yeah. so we're in a very blessed position. We've got great people. We've got a great coach. We've got continuity. And now we have a couple good young players that I think are going to grow into, into really good roles on this team. And uh, I'm really excited about it. I hope everybody is, too, because – uh, we are in it to we are in it to win it now, and yeah, let's let's go try and do it again. That was as close as he could have possibly come to saying, "We're doing it again." We're, We're doing, doing it again. <laughs> like we tried four or five different ways throughout the show to make him say like something that would have been clipped yeah. right, right for ESPN, but we, we came close enough. We'll say it. We're doing it again. Everybody, here's Josh Kroenke. Thank you so much for taking time, talking to the fan base. Thanks, everybody. To us. Yeah, Hit thank the you like guys. button for us on the way out. We'll see you at ring night. Yep. Let's go. Ring night. Like the mayor.